All right, end of the first day. You still got your heads together? I mean, you started with handsome, and that's a lot for first thing in the morning. And uh, that, so you get me at the end of the day, and you're going to get me again at the end on Friday. Although they just added another talk. There was a, they lost a talk and said, could you do an extra one tomorrow? And I'm like, sure, which one do you want? She goes, what do you got ready? It's like, well, I did a space flight in the 2020s talk. Would you like that? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, we'd like that. I'm like, okay, I'm doing space flight in the 2020s tomorrow. It's just not a lot of software, but it's fun. We'll talk about pay key, uh, price of kilos to orbit. Uh, my name is Richard Campbell. Uh, I am uh, from British Columbia, so I am quite jet lagged at the moment. I think I have to take this out, and then this wakes up, right? Wake up. Not waking up. This is my home. My home is on the left. My neighbor's home is on the right. And we call this the Animal Highway. Uh, it's a Wednesday morning, about 6 a.m. And Wednesday in my neighborhood is garbage day. So this guy's just checking to see if I put out my garbage early. That's all. I didn't because you get a fine if you put your garbage out early. And you also get it distributed all over your yard. So, uh, and you'll notice he actually stops here. His butt will stay in frame. He's just look, oh, surveying his domain. That, uh, yeah, so that's the, uh, it's bear country where I'm from, and we, we just live with them. You get used to it, believe it or not. I, I have a, the same clip of a mountain lion coming down, and that's not funny. Mountain lions are very serious. Bears are vaguely goofy, really. Black bears are pretty cautious. This, that is a garbage collector. More of a garbage distributor, actually. Although there's one big male who's learned to just grab a bag and head into the into the ravine with it, into the forest with it. So it's kind of like the bear took your garbage out for you, which is like, that's why he's lasted as long as he has. Uh, so you've run across me before. I wrote my first line of code in 1977, which is not the most important thing that happened in 1977. The most important thing that happened in 1977 was Star Wars. So I have my priorities straight. I know what's important and what isn't. Uh, and that was written on a TRS-80 Model 1, which was a microcomputer made by Radio Shack with 4K of RAM and a cassette tape player to sew the programs on, and a 127 by 47 graphical resolution. I, I think we're playing Star Trek on the screen at the time. And this had a version of BASIC in it that wasn't a Microsoft BASIC. It was actually a tiny BASIC, and it only had three error messages. What? How? And sorry. So, you know, I want to divide one by zero. Sorry. Object is not found, which really means sorry. I mean, the difference when it's Windows is that it also makes you agree with you, right? Registry is corrupt. Okay? It's not a not okay button. You have to agree your registry is corrupt or you cannot continue. Uh, I make a bunch of podcasts. This is the current list. So my friend Carl Franklin started .NET Rocks back in 2002. So 20-year anniversary coming up this summer. Um, we, we'll publish episode 1791 tomorrow. And I've been making run as since 2007. So that's a show for IT pros. And that's been every Wednesday since April of 2007. So we're at 800 and something. We did the tablet show briefly for about three years back when we weren't sure if .NET rocked and we wanted an alternative. It was a scary time. And we're going to talk about that time racing through the 20 years of history. So, and if these are free to download, if you've never listened to any of them before, um, just two idiots talking. Uh, sometimes we have a guest. Sometimes Steve Sanderson's on, and everybody's smarter. Uh, so I'm going to go 2002 to 2022 in roughly an hour, as quickly as I can. So we started in 2002, sort of set the stage for what was life like in 2002. Well, the biggest thing was the dot-com bubble had burst. Right? So in terms of just state of being, we'd had a few years of complete insanity in computing. Uh, where every idea got funded. And we were and way past just like the bad ones like pets.com. Everything got funded. They had everybody had too much money, and that ended in, in late 2001, early 2002. And it dried up too much, arguably. It, sh it shrunk right down. So, kind of wasn't a cool time to be a programmer. Like it was tough, it was a tough period. But the sort of core aspects of development never changed. The insanity around the web sort of slowed down. 
And I always keep an eye on the hardware. So it, every so often I'm going to show, throw you up to like current state of hardware at the time. Uh, PCs looked like they had looked for the past previous 20 years. By 2002, they, this, the advancement by 2002 is they were black, not beige. Uh, but back then, the Mac was already gorgeous, right? The G4 was a beautiful machine. I mean, it ran a Motorola chip, which didn't make anybody happy, but they were beautiful. And this was the top-selling phone in 2002. The Nokia, I think it's a 1200. Its claim to fame was the screen was sort of color-ish all like 1800 pixels in the display and uh, you know phones will evolve now previous to 2002 of course all that dot-com boom stuff we had been doing web development but in fairly archaic ways like we had front page for those who may remember a good way to do damage to your web server um the product i liked was was dreamweaver in terms of a, a real way to build it where you were still doing some visual coding and page creation, but it actually wrote HTML that didn't make you sad. Uh, Microsoft stack was uh, the first, this was actually the first version of Visual Studio was nine, they called 97, and they had packed all their different development tools into it, Visual Basic, Fox Pro, J++, which was a version of Java uh, that they had licensed from Sun a couple of years before. Interdev, which was their first attempt to do web development, and it was extraordinarily bad. Uh, and then, yeah, source safe and a few other bits and pieces there. The, the implication that was this was a unified development tool, it wasn't. Each of these different products had their own IDs in them. They're just in one box with a lot of three and a half inch floppies, like 60 of them. Uh, and on the Microsoft side, of course, we were using active server pages, which was our ability to use ActiveX components and have it render into an ISAPI filter. So the first version of that was. Uh, uh, was version one was 96, they got to version two in 97, and the last version, version three, was actually in 2000. So by 2002, this is technically already an obsolete technology. Uh, but the W3C has now ratified XHTML because XML, HTML is not ugly enough, and Tim Berners-Lee has convinced us that XML is a good idea. We'll get over it, but at the time, it seemed like a good idea. And I, I would be remiss not to talk a little bit about .NET because in the PDC in 2000 uh, is when Microsoft first said the words .NET. It's important to remember that this is the time when the Department, of, the United States Department of Justice is currently prosecuting uh, Microsoft as a pernicious monopoly, which they will succeed in convicting them of. And that actually happened before this PDC. And that's when Bill Gates stepped down as CEO and Steve Ballmer takes over as CEO. And so one of the things that Steve talked about at this event when we first heard about .NET was that it was going to be built on open standards, that he published the specifications for C Sharp and the runtime as ECMA specifications. So they would be available for anybody to use. And somebody did, an extremely young Miguel Diacaza in 2001 when he was 29, which is the same year that Steve Ballmer called Linux a cancer, uh, started his mono project. Now, I'm not going to say this ruined Miguel's life. <laughs> but having spent a long time talking to Miguel about this, he, I mean, he really liked the language. And he, and he thought making an implementation where Linux was a good idea. But it upset Linux people because you're working with Microsoft technology and they're the, they're the enemy. And then when you try to talk to Microsoft people, they're like, aren't you that Linux guy? So life, it was hard to be Miguel. Like Miguel was definitely in a trap. But, uh, you know, he was making things he believed in. He had a great team around him. It would take him a couple of years to get a good version out, but he would get there. And we would see um, the release candidate in 2001. Uh, I only really bring up this slide. And by the way, this slide looks really nice. But in 2001, this is the graphic for the conference, and it was 320 by 200. So the reason this looks nice is I paid a designer to make me a 1080p version of it. I'm that kind of guy. Uh, this is when Internet Explorer 6 gets released, separate from, uh, from XP. So IE6 shipped on its own. IE6 also shipped before CSS1 was ratified, which is why it was a disaster. 
Uh, it had its own version of CSS that nothing else ran. And so when we finally do get XP, it does come with IE6, which is why it sticks around so long, because people kept XP for forever. But by 2002, we do get the first version of .NET called Visual Studio .NET. It actually has 22 languages included in the box. That was their claim to fame. This was the counter to Java. Remember, Microsoft had making their own version of Java. Then some microsystem says you're not allowed to do that anymore. So that's, that leads to C Sharp and where Java's mantra at the time was one language, any platform. Microsoft's mantra was any language, one platform. The platform was Windows, for better or worse. The trick is naming 22 languages because it's hard. There was Eiffel.net once, <laughs> made it for one rev. But a bunch of languages still supported. IBM still maintains a version of Fortran.net. Fujitsu still maintains a version of COBOL.net. And then we, we have a bunch of others. Okay, and of course, Active Server Pages, ASP.net was the new version. It had nothing to do with ASP. Uh, much like Visual Basic.net had nothing to do with Visual Basic, and that made people sad. Uh, and I have had chances to talk to folks who led those teams back then who got very nasty hate mail. And admittedly, for me, who was a developer at the time, I cut over to C Sharp because it confused me less. I knew, because if you were working in VB.net, you kept writing VB things that did not work. At least when you're writing C Sharp, there was no mistaking you are not writing VB. So, you know, C Sharp made me happier. Uh, also, a fallout of the dot com bubble bursting was, you know, the collapse of Netscape and the sort of reassembly. So it's in 2002 that Firefox appears, the Mozilla project, right? The Mozilla, Mozilla being the monster that ate Mosaic, which was the original browser that became Netscape. And so this, that's how old this product is. And it will be successful for quite a while, you know. It's never gone away, but it will grow and grow. Its peak will be about 2009. It'll be about a third of all browsers. It'll be sort of its high watermark, but then Chrome shows up and ruins everything. Uh, so that's an interesting interval, those early development periods. We're really just talking about trying to find our way in the web in the fallout of that collapse. Client-server development largely doesn't change, right, in, the, in, in 2002. We're, we're just getting at the beginnings of .NET and, 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 and Java development with Java beans, like, they're eh, not that good. But if you fast forward to five years, to 2007, the, those new technologies have really taken hold. So 2002 is sort of a bracing part. But by 2007, uh, some things have changed. Dell made lots, you know, PCs that are red and silver. That was the XPS uh, with the Core Duo in it. And that is the... Um, the first generation Mac with the Intel Core Duo in it as well. Macintosh has now given up on the PowerPC chipset and has moved over to Intel like everybody else. And the most popular selling smartphone in 2007 is the Nokia 1200. We'll talk about the iPhone a little later because it was not that popular when it first came along. This is also when we get Safari, right? 2003 is when the first version of Safari comes out for the Mac. And that will create its own set of problems. But it's, you know, we're starting to see a duel between the rendering engines, these different browsers, what do we, and what do we want to have? We've got IE doing its thing. We've got Safari doing its thing. We've got Firefox doing its thing. Uh, Ruby on Rails by 2005. I mean, today, DHH, David Heinemann Hansen, is kind of a bad word. But at this time, he was... He was a, I'm not going to say so much of a prophet, but he was somebody, he built Basecamp. In fact, still builds Basecamp, which is one of these email-based tools that was so fundamental to a lot of folks. And he was responsible for grabbing an older language, a language from the 90s called Ruby, that was a dynamic language, and coupling it with a scaffolding system called Rails. Just to approach web development a little differently. You know, to, to, if I can point to set a database, spit me out the logical forms based on the relationships in the database, right? Scaffolding. So it was a very quick way to write software. And then you have this dynamic language in Ruby that was really kind of fun to code in. Now, and as long as you stopped there, you were fine. Now, if your product was actually successful, you were going to be punished for that. Because scaling it was tricky. There was a lot of 
stunts you could do in there. But it did put the scare on to Microsoft because Microsoft had been pretty stodgy in the way they were doing web development. They were abundantly aware of how much Ruby on Rails was accelerating web development was the, the hot thing to do. Um, it's hard to imagine, but the first incarnation of Amazon Web Services goes all the way back to 2002. Amazon's a warehousing company, right? And destroyer of worlds. And so their primary goal was, an, was being able to get as many stores onto their infrastructure as possible. And so they were coming up with a way to build sets of virtual machines on demand, self-service virtual machines. It happened to make the cloud. It was an accident. But those first, they, we don't hear much about this early, these early days because they literally turned this pro entire product off twice before you get to 2006, where it sort of sticks to the version that, that, um, that we now kind of know about. It, um, it, it took a while to evolve. It, the relaunch in 2006 was S3 and EC2 and their, their version of the SQL Store. Uh, Microsoft is trying to get hit with web development, so they start a conference called Mix in 2006. It was very fun. It was in Las Vegas, by the way also remade by a designer for me because see how nice it looks? I have the only one. Uh, and so this is where they're trying to have web conversations a little broader. This is also where IE7 comes out. So there's been a five-year gap. They released IE6 in, in 2001. Now it's 2006 and they put out IE7. Anybody wondering where that team went for five years? They were building Avalon, which we now know as WPF. Because after they put out IE6, Bill Gates was pretty much convinced, okay, we've solved the browser, now let's rewrite the internet. And his original intent for what would become XAML was a better language for the internet. It didn't end up going that way, but that was the original intent and they spent five years on it. And I would also point out that that's also the period where he stepped down as CEO and he's now chief architect and he clearly has too much time on his hands. Um, Microsoft started CodePlex. I have not built a nice high-scaled version of this graphic, you will notice. Uh, at the time, so open source source control was mostly source forge or your own private you know, repositories. The, the idea of social coding, what GitHub became, is still a few years away. But uh, the motivations for CodePlex were interesting because part of it was Microsoft was on a very much enterprise development pattern of 18 to 24 months to deliver a new version of Studio. And so it was a long time to wait. And when you had in the open source communities where you had things like Ruby on Rails that were literally iterating weekly, maybe monthly, the powers that be were concerned about how can we deliver more code more often and can we interact with our customers about it as we go. And so Coplex was a place to put source code that they were developing internally and get feedback that people could download and utilize and then get give feedback to and then we'd iterate that way. And a lot of stuff landed on Coplex. One of the, I think the first hit that arrived at Coplex was the Ajax libraries. So tooling to allow you to do interactive pages. And that would eventually grow into spas, but that's before this time. Uh, but many more important products will end up on Coplex, and they're a, they're a way for Microsoft to iterate on products independent of that slower studio cycle. Uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention some of the big hits of like 2007, like Vista. And this thing. Yeah, um, this is June of 2007. It was a 2G phone in a 3G world, so we, it was soundly made fun of. Uh, the interesting thing, of course, is that they found the form factor. Like, this is it for phones after that. Like, before the iPhone, phones were kind of cool, right? You could get attachments and antennas and keyboards and slidey things and so forth. And after the iPhone, it's all slabs of black glass. So in a lot of ways, the phone ended there. Now, of course, they will iterate quickly and make a better and better phone, and we all know how quickly it caught on. Uh, Jobs says at the time, if you're going to program for the iPhone, you'll program in Safari. He was wrong. Very quickly, hackers figured out how to break the jailbreak the phone, 
And so in a panic to not lose control of the phone, he releases his, the internal development tools for the iPhone, uh, which is why they were terrible, right? Coco, Xcode, all of those tools, they were internal tools. They were not meant to be used outside of Apple, and so they were not very robust. Uh, and it took a while, arguably never, to make them better. Yeah. It's only degrees of suckage. Um, and along came Silverlight. Now, WPF had been released in 2006 as a fallout of Vista. So they made a, ver they made a sort of pseudo version of .NET. In right? 2005, they'd had .NET 2. Now they had created a .NET 3, which is just like .NET 2, just with extra addressing. Uh, and that included all the things that fell out of Vista, which was WPF, WCF, uh, uh, workflow, card space. It was a host of different tools. Not that anybody inside of Microsoft used them. They sort of pushed them onto the .NET team. It was the .NET team's problem. Silverlight was originally, its code name was WPFE or Windows Presentation Foundation Everywhere. Now, there are simple rules at Microsoft. One of the rules is if you have a cool code name, like Avalon, you get a crappy product name, like Windows Presentation Foundation. And so the folks that were leading this project said, let's start with a crappy code name, WPFE, so we get a good product name, Silverlight. Where does the name Silverlight come from? Well, what is Silverlight? There is a thing that is Silverlight. Do you remember the old uh, rotating square bulbs for your camera when you take pictures and they, they, and they would flash? They were all one shot. They had little magnesium coils in them, so it'd go, it would flash once and then it would turn 90 degrees and that would give you another flash. You get four to a cube. The debris after you fire that flash is called Silverlight because Silverlight is what comes after flash. So the original version had no .NET in it whatsoever. It was, it was an engine for Reed Hastings for Netflix to be able to run the IIS media player to do variable speed video transmission. So you could vary between from 240p up to 1080p automatically. They had all these encoded streams, and this was the player side of that. So this is what built Netflix. Subsequent versions would, they'd incorporate .NET into it, .NET into it which meant building a runtime for .NET that ran on the Mac in 2008. And they used Coplex to iterate on it. They would put out three versions of Silverlight in two years, which is not normal for Microsoft. So it was a fast moving thing. Uh, another response to, to Rails and to web development was the .NET MVC. And uh, one of the ma major participants in that, that particular product is, uh, out there, is here. Scott Guthrie was, was interested in getting this product made. He led the web team at the time. Uh, it was Elion, I believe, that actually wrote the original versions of it. And then he showed the prototypes to various open source types that he liked, that he thought could be a part of Microsoft. And so he used them to, to bring them in. The push towards open source was getting so serious inside of Microsoft. And also outside of Microsoft, there was a group of folks that were trying to convince Microsoft to use more open source code. And I first encountered them as the .NET Rocks guy trying to interview some Microsoft people at the MVP Summit about, uh, about a product called Entity Framework. This is before it was released. And so I went to one of the meetings, the SDRs, for the pre-version of Entity Framework, and there were a group of folks in there who were a little animated. Uh, they were banging on tables animated. Now, these guys were all into nHibernate. So Hibernate was a Java ORM, and they'd made a, web, a .NET version called nHibernate, and it was a great product if you really liked XML, because it made lots of XML. Uh, it, was, you know, it, had, it had its problems, it was an open source library, and so these folks were very much into, listen, don't make another ORM, help us with nHibernate. Right? That was the, the push they were making, and they were vociferous. Uh, so I called them the nHibernate Mafia on .NET Rocks. And within a week, they called themselves Alt.NET. Uh, they weren't wrong, especially if in the context of today, right, of using open source libraries as part of your development practice in the Microsoft community. In 2008, that was a pretty avant-garde idea. And here, you know, 14 years later, it's not. 
One would argue their methods. They were uh, a little intense. But these were the early days of open source at Microsoft, and there was a move towards it. Things MVC also lived on CodePlex and was iterated via its communication with the community. And MVC was used by Scott Guthrie to hire in these open source folks, and it was folks like Phil Hack and Rob Connery and Scott Hanselman. And so they did a book together. This is a composite picture from the book cover. It's a giant lie. They were never in the same room together. And Scott Guthrie's head is actually bigger than all of those guys' head. Rob Connery's head's not that big. I know I've, you know, so I measure my friendships based on the number of continents I've been drunk with you on. There's a couple of twos and threes in this room, right? Um, Hanselman doesn't drink, so he won't, he won't count. Guy, Connery's a three, Hack's a four, Guthrie's a five. <laughs> but uh, yeah, all friends, and uh, that was the MVC book, and really the push towards open source that started catching on inside of Microsoft. So M Microsoft was building MVC by writing the code internally, taking a cut of it, pushing it to CodePlex, making it available for folks to play with. They called them previews. And you would take it out for a spin and you'd give them feedback. And they you know, ran into various features that they would need to incorporate. And by 2009, they'd get V1. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that as we go further along. And we get, let's jump up to 2012. And I would argue this is the darkest time on the Microsoft side, but it's a great time for web development. Uh, devices. Uh, the MacBook Air is now the sexiest laptop uh, in the world at the time, by far. It will also julienne cabbage, right? It's the edges on it are pretty sharp, be careful. Uh, and Dell makes the Air equivalent, I guess. <laughs> a little thicker, a little bulkier. Uh, this is the era of the P4 laptop. So it's like you can put it on your lap, but you may not be able to have children again afterwards, right? Uh, and we have the iPhone 5, and the, uh, and the Samsung Galaxy, the, the smartphone movement is well underway. Android is definitely a thing. Uh, we got, in, by 2008, we got the first version of Chrome. That's really the decline of Firefox, for better or worse. Uh, almost exactly the same time is when Google does their app engine. And that will become the um, Google Cloud Platform. Right? This is the beginnings of that. Everybody's responding to AWS. We'll talk about Microsoft's response in a moment. Uh, this is also the era of destroying Internet IE6. IE6 won't go away. Uh, it's now this browser is like seven, eight years old, right? The IE7 and 8 are still out, and IE6 is still more popular, right? And, and we talk about the IE6 of browsers in this because it was popular but not compliant with standards, right? Pretty much the way Safari is today. And the problem that meant is you could build a web page for everybody else, and then you had to do something that would work for IE6. And it was actually DHH, once again, put out a letter in uh, um, July of 2008 where he said, listen, I'm not writing any more IE6 compatible code in Basecamp. I'm done. If you're still using IE6, upgrade or die. And a whole bunch of folks jumped on board. Um, there was a Norwegian online newspaper that was like next. And they literally, if you'd go to their site on, with IE6, it would pop up a thing that said, this site does not render in IE6. Go get a real browser. Here's links. Right? And even and then Hanselman jumped on board too. It's like, you really need to stop using IE6. But it's because people held on to XP. This, this persistence, this is Vista's fault. Right? This won't actually get fixed until Windows 7 ships. Because we, we all skipped Vista for various reasons, you know, that was the holdout. So we get rid of IE6, and we focus more on uh, the evolution of, of uh, Silverlight. So we get up to uh, version 4 by 2010. I got to talk about this book. In December of 2008, Doug Crockford wrote JavaScript to boot parts, because apparently there were some. Um, and, at, and at everybody I've ever talked to who worked seriously on modern JavaScript, who got into the V8 engine and Chakra and Node, this book 
hit them hard. Doug Crockford's an interesting character. And, and what he was, you know, his point was, there are, this, this was not a good language. It was a scripting language that was tightly down to the, bound to the DOM. And if we uncoupled it, it would be better. And these were the parts that would make sense, right? It was a very thin book because JavaScript, the bad parts, was really thick. Um, but it, it was an, for me, I think it was a very pivotal moment. A lot of important people that were going to work on JavaScript from this point forward got to work. I think that's in 2008. And in a few years, JavaScript will be transformed. This is also the era of Ray Ozzie as the architect at Microsoft. And he's the one who announced the Windows Azure, right? The Windows Cloud. Uh, it won't matter much at that time. The funny thing is that they, what he was actually describing at the time, the web role and the app role, was very much serverless computing at a time when nobody wanted it, right? We were buying VMs from Amazon and we knew how to do that. And if you wanted a coding engine that you didn't have to own, you just could deploy code to it, there was Google App Engine for that. And they were, so they were sort of Google App Engine, sort of not. Like it was a tough time. Azure didn't make a lot of sense this early on. This is also when Sun Microsystems finally runs out of money and Oracle buys them. And uh, for better or worse. And of course, that is going to impact Java the most. And I haven't talked a whole lot about Java through this because for the most part, Java's just been doing its thing. But as Sun started to peter out, so we got, when we got to five, uh, there was now like a five-year span, or Java 6 comes out in 2006, and there won't be Java 7 until 2011. And that is the period where Sun starts to sputter, and it's Oracle that ends up buying them, for better or worse. You know, I think for the most part, Oracle seemed to ignore Java for a long time. They seem to be paying a bit more attention now. Iteration rates are going up. Java is getting more robust. Uh, Windows 7 comes along and finally puts Vista to bed, and everybody's happier. Hooray! Uh, and we get um, the first version of Windows Azure in 2010, which supports Java, .NET, PHP, and their version of SQL Azure. And then the big iPad, uh, big iPhone comes out. In some ways, I feel like um, phone development was in a safe place before the tablet came out because we were making M dots back then, right? It was normal for you to build a desktop browser edition of a, of a website and then you build a mobile edition of a website. You wouldn't try and combine them. The tablet ruined that because three is too many, right? You're not going to make a T dot. So now we started dealing with things like media queries and so forth. Um, this is also, uh, with this, this, this guy's announced in March of 2020, and then Studio 2020 ships in April. And this was a big deal, right? The version 4 of .NET cleaned up all the stuff from Vista as well. It's where we first got the ability to compile the 64-bit. It's when we WPF modernizes because WPF is actually part of the GUI of Studio. The first product at Microsoft to actually use WPF is Visual Studio. We get F Sharp. And we get jQuery in the box. Now, why the heck was jQuery in the box? Well, go back to MVC and Coplex. So Microsoft's maturing MVC, and version 2 will ship in Studio 2010, and they realize they need a DOM tree navigator, as you do if you're going to get serious about modern web development. And so they start writing their own and they push it out through Codeplex. And much like the N Hibernate guys with any framework, the MVC guys on Codeplex go, don't do it. We're all using jQuery. Just use jQuery. And Microsoft listens. And so for the first time, includes an open source library in their retail product. You can still request tech support from Microsoft for jQuery because it's still included in the box. And Microsoft, for their own rights, will contribute to jQuery, and then will help set up the jQuery Foundation, which today we know as the JavaScript Foundation. But I look at it as a milestone for Microsoft that they shipped an open source product as part of their product. It's like, we're taking a dependency on jQuery. Right? You, if you're going to use MVC, you should be using jQuery. And we'd argue we should be still using jQuery, because apparently we all are. 
Um, Google releases the first version of Angular JS in 2000. It was originally an internal product in 2008. It's fun to spelunk the old websites about this because folks were using internal Google sites and they really liked the way they interacted. And so they started sniffing through the code and said, there's some internal library they're using here. That's cool. Like, I wonder how we get it. Uh, internally at Google, there, the team that had built this thing was selling, trying to sell it to other teams within Google. And it was one of the VPs inside of Google that said, hey, if it's really that good, why is nobody using it out in the wild? Why are you making us use it? And so they productized it and made, um, originally just called Angular. Then they decided to redo everything for version two. So hence the Angular JS, right? Which is the old version, the one X versions. And Angular is now started with two plus, and what are they at now? 14, because they iterate numbers. Uh, non-stop so and I see this as the maturation of the single page application of the mindset of I don't care what's on the back end I just want to make API calls and I'll do my rendering on the front end and this will spawn Vue and React and Durandal and many other uh, libraries in, in this vein but it in a lot of ways starts with Angular for better or worse this is also when we, we have to solve the media query or responsive web design. Uh, 2009 is when we get CSS3 media queries, and so now the ability to render to different sizes and to change specifications on the fly so that it works on all the different platforms. Uh, doesn't mean you used it right. As with most technologies, if it's actually good enough, it, you can make a mess, right? It's like, CSS, it's your foot. And the real battle of the browsers, I think, is in starts in big time in 2011. When IE9 comes along and the Chakra engine is starting to do optimizations in a big way, they start using the GPU, they start doing pre-com, and the Chrome team's doing the same thing. And every time they ship a version that hits new performance numbers, they send the other team a cake, right, with, a, with, their, with their logo on it and congratulations. Like, they were kind of having fun with it. And so was the Mozilla team. Like they, they, they were doing important things in that implementation as well. But Node, which had been around for a couple of years at this point, when they moved over to the V8 engine, was this real context of JavaScript doesn't have to live in a browser. Now I can have a, a server-side engine that is by default off, right? Which is not how web servers existed before that. Like, IIS and Apache both had the same tendency. They were these Swiss Army knives with every blade out. It's like, what do you need? I have everything, and it's all on, right? You know, the name Apache is not necessarily the, 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 the uh, Native Americans from America. It's literally a patchy server. You install the bootloader on it, and then all it does is pull patches in. So Node was the opposite of that. It was, I do nothing until you tell me to do something. And you're going to have to build each blade you need. And you're going to build it in JavaScript. And you're going to like it. Uh, and it's a very fundamentally philosophical different way to think about it. But it also reflects the era. You know, in tw by 2010, 2011, we're pretty tired of being hacked. And this default behavior of turning things on, it's wrong. You need to only minimize your surface area. You know, instead of IIS actually starting to turn stuff off, no, you ran another piece of software that figured out what was on and helped you turn it off. So, you know, not, in my mind, Node was incredibly important at that time because it just said, you know, you don't have to do it this way. You can actually approach it from the only turn on what you need perspective. But Microsoft's not finished kicking itself in the head. It's 2011 and they are announcing Windows 8. This is the first build. I was there with Carl. It was a developer's conference, and they didn't talk about .NET at all. They did talk about WinJS because they, were, they figured, you know, the point had been that they needed a lingua franca, right, that was going to work on all, all the platforms. There was now a diversity of platforms between iPad and iPhone, Android devices, as well as Windows devices. There was billions of them. And so you needed something that was going to work across all of them. And the only thing that will work across everything is JavaScript. Now, the only reason that broke was because of Steve Jobs. Jobs didn't want 
flash to run on the iPad because it killed the battery. So he wrote a letter, thoughts on flash. And what he, was re what he said, which was also true, was we can't have plugins anymore. And if you remember back in 2010, 2011, right, in, that, in that exploit era, every one of your family members had an address bar that wasn't an address bar. It's at some point they had clicked on something that had replaced their flipping address bar, right? That was the plugin era. And so what Jobs was saying was true. Plugins, bad. Make plugins go away. And that was bad for Flash, but also was bad for Silverlight. And so that was the death knell of that. And so by the time we get to, to build and Microsoft trying to respond to the iPad by making a tablet version of Windows, they're convinced that JavaScript is the future. They were wrong. Thank goodness. Uh, and, my, and Carl and I walked out of build in 2011 in Anaheim going, hey, maybe .NET doesn't rock. And we make a show called .NET Rocks. What are we going to do? So we made the tablet show. You remember the dates? We started in 2011. Like a month after build, we had another show running. And we, th we do it for three years. And I do tablet topics and cross-platform development there. And then after three years, it's like, it turns out .NET rocks. We rolled it back into .NET. Uh, Microsoft's also working on the Roslyn project at this time. Now, the simplest way to look at Roslyn was it was a, compi a C Sharp compiler written in C Sharp. Now, this is a normal thing for mature languages to do, right? Once you're kind of happy with your language, you should write a compiler for your language in your language. I know it's recursive, but it's something that happens. But you realize this is 2011. Like, the language now 10 years old is a huge install base. And they've not gotten around to doing this. So why did they do it now? And the main reason they did it at this point was Visual Studio. Because Visual Studio had its own IntelliSense compiler for C Sharp. As you were writing C Sharp, it was evaluating it and putting squiggly lines on, telling you how you're doing it wrong. And then it also had the main compiler that you had to compile to separately. And everything was bad if those two things weren't perfectly in sync. And the feature set was getting large enough that it was getting expensive. And so they wanted a compiler as a service, one compiler that could do all of the things. That is what got Roslyn over the line. They act, but they originally started developing Roslyn through CodePlex. So you could take Roslyn out for a spin as it was being developed. And some interesting products were sort of spawning off of Roslyn, but because it was open source in CodePlex, there were no go live licenses. There was no, there was, it was all supposed to be for experimentation only. And there was an outcry around that. And they eventually invented a license where you, if you downloaded it and deployed it yourself into a piece of software, then you could have a license to run it as much as you want, but you couldn't package it in existing pieces of software. And so folks were building installers that would then force you to go to a browser to download Roslyn so that they could do the installation for it just to be compliant with the license. They'll fix that. It'll take a little while. Uh, in that dark time of, of .NET, a much older Miguel Diacaza, this is 2011 as well. Like, it's kind of crazy when you think about this, right? Thoughts on Flash, WinJS, you know, you know, no focus on .NET whatsoever, C Sharp is doomed, Miguel Diacaza shows up, the um, Novell has been bought by Attachmate. Novell had, been, had owned Mono for a long time. An attached mate looks at Mono and says, huh, this doesn't make any money. You can stop developing on it now. And Miguel doesn't think that's a good idea at all. So he calls his, man, his friend Nat Friedman and says, we got to do something. And they make a new company. And then they talk attached mate into giving them all the rights to all of the Mono related things, including Mono Touch. And Mono Touch was an implementation of Mono that compiled onto the iPhone. He'd had, it, he'd had it working for a couple of years at this point, and in 2011, he got it working in Android as well. And on the show, I said, hey, Microsoft doesn't seem to care much about C-sharp these days, but Miguel sure seems to, because I can run C-sharp in all kinds of weird places. We had the Roslyn project where we were standing up scriptable C-sharp in, in its own little run times and having a good time with that. And here was Xamarin now running it on the iPhone and the Android. Like C-sharp was alive and well, just not at Microsoft. Uh, web development takes a great step forward in indifference towards design with Bootstrap in August of 2011. Next, uh, TypeScript. So 
At the end of 2010, An Anders Halsberg stepped down from leading the C Sharp team and put Mads Torgensen in charge, who's a great shepherd of C Sharp. But it scared a lot of people at the time. It was all part of this narrative of C Sharp is dead. You know, Anders has moved on and so forth. He was working on types. He, he'd gotten fascinated with the JavaScript problem and he wanted to make it better. And that would become TypeScript, although it would take a couple of years. But it was part of that scary era was how do we provide good typing systems for a non-typed language, right? For, you know, typing to JavaScript and wildly successful. There's another very important aspect of JavaScript, of TypeScript that I think most people weren't aware of. Microsoft was convinced that they could never be good in the open source community, right? That they were always the bad guy. And, and Anders pulled, proved them wrong. When TypeScript shipped in, in, in 2012, the, the betas, the open source community loved it because it was a problem that actually needed to be solved. And serious open source groups started at doing the plugins for TypeScript. The Palantir group actually wrote a TypeScript plugin for Eclipse. And then, so suddenly there's all this evidence that when you actually build the right thing in the open source community, the open source community will embrace you even if you're Microsoft. And it shifted minds inside of Microsoft. It was an impactful moment for them to actually change that. Enough that they made a new version of their logo after 25 years, and they've, this is when the three colored block shows up. Microsoft's trying to figure out how to do open source right. In 2012, they started a group called MS Open Tech. On the outside, for all of us, it was about making sure there were good .NET libraries for major open source libraries. So Redis, MMcached, all those kinds of tools. This is where they would make sure that they, were, they, they maintained good libraries so those products all worked well but also internally, they had Microsoft employees working on open source projects, but they created a wholly owned subsidiary called MS Open Tech to make that work because lawyers. I don't think it was necessary. They'll eventually roll it up in 2015, but that's what they did at that time. The other thing that happens in 2012 is uh, we get the version of Visual Studio for 2012. This is the one that supports the first time they support ARM processors because they're now making the Surface machines that are ARM and we show off just how great .NET is because they can just change the runtime and boom, you can compile on ARM, magic. Most people remember Studio 2012 for all the menus are in uppercase and that is horrible. And so we get to build 2012 when Windows 8 ships and all the focus that they put on building code in JavaScript results in 2% of the apps in the Windows App Store are built using WinJS and 80% of them are built using c -sharp, .NET, and XAML. So they may not have loved c -sharp a whole lot back then, but c -sharp loved them back. Didn't save Win8, though. Ha <laughs> ha! And so we get to 2017. Everybody's hardware is a bit sexier, except for the Mac. The Mac has gone from silver to black, but the Pro has 18 cores. It's like they're out of, they're out of the cool, stylish ideas, so let's just make it big and fast. The iPhone 8 is out, now in rose gold, because that's a good idea. And the, X, the new version of the XPS is sort of vaguely silver, and it still has a DVD in 2017 for some reason. But back up a little, because in 2014, we have the transformative build. This is the build where Sachin Adela does his first keynote as CEO of Microsoft. And he leads with... Windows is free for devices with screens nine inches and smaller. If you want to think about the change of Microsoft's thinking at that point, that was what he led with for a reason. Windows is no longer the center of the company. Azure is the center of the company. And so we will give away Windows when it makes sense. That's also why he renames Windows Azure, Microsoft Azure. Because that's what they're building the whole company around now. This is when... Rosalind, which was originally a Windows-only product done on CodePlex, moves over to GitHub and is a cross-platform product. So they, you know, the shifts are happening now, that they're building all of the things this way. It's also in 2014 we finally ratify the specifications for HTML5 and CSS, which what a lot of people had been counting on for a long time. I mean, it doesn't fix all of the problems, but... The web has a language now and an approach to the language that's sustainable. We'll go into the you know, rolling ECMA specifications going forward that make it a lot more robust. And Microsoft makes their next hit in, in the open source community. 
in the form of Visual Studio Code. The first intentional hit in open source. It's like, wh what could we do to make a really great editor? Planned from the outset. It's going to be open source all the way. Like, what would we do? And they did it. And it's now, I think, the most popular editor on the planet, for better or worse. Uh, but it also, to me, speaks to how the company evolved, that they recognized this is in their best interest to build this cross-platform or open source from the outset. Not migrated to it, not also and, but the whole purpose would be like that. Uh, we get Windows 10 and the weird version of Microsoft Edge that nobody wanted to use, although it did use Chrome plugins somehow. Um, it'll eventually evolve into a version of Edge that's a little more interesting for folks. But Win 10 was also supposed to be our last version of Windows. 2016, Xamarin gets acquired, becomes part of Microsoft. And these guys go inside. Um, Nat will go on to be the CEO of, he'll, he'll work inside on the TFS team, and then he'll go be CEO of GitHub when they acquire that a couple of years later. Miguel uh, gets involved with dealing with XAML and a bunch of other cool projects. Both now have left the company by 2022. So things have moved on. And now we're definitely getting into Steve Sanders' space because when Behrman and Russell published a specification uh, over on the Chrome team for the progressive web app, it's like, how do we involve web development to be more like just app development? Have a manifesto that we have an icon, have services that persist across connectivity problems. You know, that, that is the evolution, and, and it's still an evolving thing, but we're trying to make web development more robust. It, uh, they've, Microsoft finally commits to rewriting .NET as a cross-platform uh, open source project. It was cheaper to rewrite it than to try and fix the old one. Not that the old one was broken as long as you were running it on Windows, but it was built from the ground up to be a tool for enterprise developers to build Windows apps, and it was hard to change that. So it was easier to start over, as challenging it is. And then I saw my st friend, Steve Sanderson, in 2017 in Oslo with WebAssembly and this weird version of C-sharp he'd found, and he was running C-sharp on the browser, and all our heads exploded. <laughs> like, you're doing what? And WebAssembly had been around for a while. And really what it was was a way to expose the runtime of the browser so that you know, JavaScript lived within that. And the fact that you could simply insert another language into that space was interesting. And he was, I think, one of the first to really show what the possibilities were. Uh, and it scared Microsoft. I think that's a fair thing to say. They kind of put it over in the corner. He's sitting right there. It's tough to talk about a guy when he's sitting right there. Uh, and they sort of put it in a corner. It's like, we're just going to make this a research project for a while. We're not really sure what to do. Although that next year, Miguel Diacaza very publicly on Twitter goes, I think this thing is awesome, and it should be running a mono, and we're going to make it work. Uh, and it got better. And it became what we now know as Blazor. And it felt like Microsoft hesitated on that long enough to wait till somebody else went first. I think when the Go implementation was really running well as WebAssembly, then they relaxed a bit. But you know that they, that pattern of evolution and this approach to open source is very interesting. A challenge for Microsoft. The Kubernetes story to me is another important one on the open source story and this evolution development. Containerization is a logical extension of virtualization. Right? This is, you know, at the simplest level, you can see containerization is virtualization by getting the operating system out. Just make my code. Let's, can I stop having gigabyte virtual instances? I just, I'll tell you what OS I need to run. You find an instance to run it with, go. But from a political perspective, it was more, it, for us as developers, organizing code that way, starting to have a manifest for all communications, right? It's, building fundamental perimeters, but also talking about portability, running in different places. And, the, and nobody seemed to get too upset about Docker containers. We're all fine with that. Poor Docker's never made a penny on any of it, but we're all going to use it, and that's great. Still runs better on Linux than Windows, because that's just because Windows is having a tough time with this. But the orchestrators were the interesting part, because there were a bunch. Docker was making Swarm. There was uh, DCOS, Mesos, and there was Kubernetes. And Kubernetes came from Google. Right, it's actually part of the Google uh, of GCP. It was this fellow, Brendan Burns, uh, who led the project inside of Google, and then Microsoft poached him, brought him over to to Microsoft, 
and then gave them space to build a version of Kubernetes that ran in Azure. And so suddenly you could, if you were working in Kubernetes containers, they ran equally as well on GCP as they ran on Azure. And the Amazon guys weren't having any of that. And so suddenly Amazon had implementation of, of Kubernetes services. And that impacted the market because now all the big players could run the orchestration engine for you and you could run it at home. And so the other orchestration engines kind of didn't make sense. And the side effect of that was enough people getting together that suddenly an ecosystem grew up around Kubernetes. I mean, Kubernetes is far from perfect, but now we're getting tooling in the forms of stuff like Helm and Nav and, and to help you work in that space. It's like we wanted a monopoly, one orchestration engine, but it's not monopolized by any given vendor. It's an open source project contributed to by multiple of these big companies and supported by all of them. And that to me seems like a really interesting evolution of the way things are going to work going forward. I'm not saying it's all gonna be good. Open source is being changed by the tech giants, and this is one of the examples. It seems to be beneficial, but we have to pay attention to the fact that open source is being transformed by the presence of these titans. Uh, 2017 is when Coplex goes into archive only. It's now flatly down. You know, we're all in GitHub now, for better or worse. Microsoft took a long time to get deeply involved in GitHub. The original uh, GitHub logo, I mean, this was about social coding. That, that was the concept. And then they got the Octocat and all those other cool graphics. But uh, by 2018, it was bought by Microsoft, largely to the relief of folks. You know, it was kind of leaked on a Friday that they were going to announce they were buying it on a Monday. And there was a few folks who were like, oh my God, I'm going to GitLab. I'm getting out of here. And they're like, GitLab, you mean that thing that runs on Azure? Okay. Uh, but it was always tough for this company to make money. And you now it kind of didn't have to. It had been held as a wholly owned subsidiary. Nat went to run it for a time, which most folks that were at GitHub at the time knew him and had co confidence in him. Now it's Thomas Demke who's, who's taken it over from there. But it's the repository for source code for most of the development community, for better or worse. And uh, .NET Core has now grown up. They have made, uh, well, we'll have, we're now on an annual cadence. So .NET 5 came out in 2020, .NET 6 in 2021, .NET 7 will be at the end of 2022. So we're, and now they've changed the life cycle. So .NET 5 is already going out of support where a long-term supported version of .NET is three years. They're basically insisting that we keep our code being buildable. Another side effect of the GitHub ownership is this beginning of using machine learning inside of programming and understanding code. So, I mean, there's lots of fun things to talk about in this era now. This is technically historical, but it's absolutely current around artificial intelligence. I mean, the problem is we've made movies, right? The first movie really was 2001 A Space Odyssey. 1968, it's an old movie, but it's the first time, like artificial intelligence is an ancient technology, right? First, the term is coined in the 50s. But it was a science term. It wasn't for regular people. But Kubrick brought it into regular people in 2001 A Space Odyssey with Hal, who then tried to kill everybody. Gee, I wonder why we're freaked out by AI. Um, but they've taken all that code, feeding it through these advanced parsers in the open AI space, and now we're seeing things like GitHub Copilot. And, uh, and the, um, the game maker where I'm writing out descriptive language into GPT-3 and it's spitting out code, all right? This is OpenAI's codex. So, the, you know, this is an old um, William Gibson line, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. If you push on the sort of edges of what we're doing in coding, you're seeing these new technologies and they're not, replacing us, you're still writing the intent of what you're supposed to do. It's still just a tool extending us. But this is today, this is current history, right? I mean, we've done things like AlphaGo where we solved playing Go. But have you seen what the technology that AlphaGo has done lately? You know, they, the second iteration with AlphaZero was a more generalized engine where you literally showed it a set of rules and it started playing itself. Well, those same guys are now working on Alpha Fold. Alpha Fold is them using that, mo that modeling system to figure out protein folding. For the most part, AI technologies that we've seen 
in the past few years have done things that we could do just not as quickly or as inexpensively or hard to pay attention to, you know, using vision recognition to find cancers in a radiological screen. That's something a person can do, but the computer's really good at it and faster at it. This is something we can't do. We've been trying to solve protein folding problems for a really long time, and we basically have to do it through brute experimentation. But they have built a, a model for calculating protein folding behaviors that's now scoring in the 80, 90 percent accuracy rates. And that is a fundamental change. And it's a different kind of programming. This is very biological programming. But it's part of the technology that we're currently working in. Uh, we're out of time, and certainly not out of topic. There's more coming. And actually, the talk I'll do on Friday on the next decade of software development picks up from here and goes out. right? And I'm going to make some guesses but I'm a good guesser. So we see some things that are coming from there, and I hope you'll come and see us there. Thank you for your time.